Good day, everyone. I'm Lou Marinoff. And for the first time, I'd like to share with you the backstory of Therapy for the Sane, which has just been republished by Waterside Productions Incorporated. And here it is. As every author knows, the publishing world can be wild, woolly, and well nigh unpredictable. Therapy for the Sane was conceived and written as a sequel to Plato Not Prozac. In retrospect, a tough act to follow. Having been initially rejected by every major publisher in New York, Plato Not Prozac received a second look from HarperCollins, which published it in 1999. It swiftly became an international bestseller. Then in early 2001, I faced a different challenge, writing a successful sequel. My agent of record submitted the finished proposal for therapy for the sane in the summer of 2001, and this time half a dozen major New York publishers expressed their interest. Bloomsbury sought to make a preemptive offer for world English rights. They sensibly wanted the book, and understandably, they did not want the proposal going to auction. Bloomsbury is a fine English publishing house and was then in the process of opening a New York office to establish a beachhead in the U.S. market. They were looking for franchise U.S. authors and their acquisitions editor envisioned me in that role. So far, so good. So we met with Bloomsbury, which indeed acquired the book with the preemptive offer. Before the meeting ended, I distinctly recall reminding them that I am not politically correct, a British understatement, and that this book, as indicated clearly in the proposal, contained a chapter critiquing political correctness and another chapter discussing social consequences of sex difference, not gender difference. I'm talking about sex, sex difference. No problem, said the editor-in-chief, but he had misspoken it was going to be an enormous problem. At times, the publishing industry resembles a revolving door with editors coming and going at a dizzying pace. An author is fortunate indeed if the same editor who acquires his book remains in place long enough to see it through publication or production and into print. I would come to meet many authors whose books fell through these cracks, ending up orphaned or even aborted by the very houses that had acquired them. A therapy for the sane would soon meet a similar fate. Having signed with Bloomsbury, I got straight to work on the manuscript. I live for creativity and take pride in professionalism. In the nonfiction world, publishers acquire proposals and expect finished manuscripts to resemble them closely. So it was with therapy for the sane. I delivered the finished manuscript in early December, 2002 right on schedule, and was invited to a production meeting shortly thereafter. As I eagerly made my way to Bloomsbury's funky offices in the historic Flatiron building, little did I suspect that this meeting was going to be the literary equivalent of a train wreck. Seated around the conference table was the new chief editor, along with her in-house publicity and promotion team. My agent met me there and we took our seats. The editor who had acquired the title was long gone through the revolving door and no longer in the picture. The person now in charge wasted little time in showing her politically correct colors. She called the meeting to order and aired her first agenda point. We have to change the title, she began. We can't call it therapy for the sane. Why in heaven's name not, I inquired. It's a great title and everybody who hears it loves it. Because, she replied evenly, it might offend the insane. I could scarcely believe my ears. How could offering normal people philosophical guidance for everyday life possibly offend inmates of insane asylums? But this is exactly what's wrong with political correctness. Its cardinal rule is never to say anything that anyone else finds offensive. If someone feels offended by what you say, it becomes your fault. In other words, we are all held responsible for everybody else's state of mind, but never for our own. But offenses are not like harms. They cannot be inflicted on others as our harms against their wills. 
if I harm you physically, then I am indeed responsible for inflicting a harm. But if you decide to take offense at something I say verbally, then you are responsible for taking it. Fear of offending others, which stems from confusing offense with harm, ends up imposing censorship on society entire, preventing people from asking important questions, such as, if I'm offended, am I harmed? Ultimately, political correctness will muzzle every philosopher in existence, since we thrive on asking questions, even if some folks prefer not to hear them. While it's your prerogative not to listen, no one has a right to censor questioning itself. So given this chief editor's fear that a book title might offend the insane, I could not help blurting out, you are apparently well qualified to know. This witticism apparently went straight over her head, which was just as well. Otherwise, she surely would have felt offended herself. We're going to call it the big questions, she continued. But that's insipid, I responded, and totally unoriginal. There are already philosophy books with that title. It grows on you, piped up a publicist. Nothing grows on me, I replied. I shower every morning. Nobody laughed. Moreover, the chief editor continued, we're going to delete two chapters. If you're offended, are you harmed? And can anyone win the war of the sexes? But those are two of the most important chapters in the book, I objected. They provide vital insights into problems afflicting contemporary societies. In point of fact, they were part and parcel of the proposal. Your house bought the proposal. Nobody objected to them then. I categorically refuse to be censored now. She scowled but relented. What was left of the meeting then concluded. I departed with my agent who had remained silent throughout. Only when we exited the building did she speak. You took a big gamble standing up to her, my agent said. She could have killed the book then and there. She had already defanged it by changing the title and was attempting to neuter it by removing those two chapters, I replied. Killing it would have put it out of its misery. So Therapy for the Sane came out in 2003, retitled The Big Questions. It was otherwise uncensored. The line editor on the project had also silently agreed with me, although he too had held his tongue during that fateful meeting, prudently preferring to err on the side of keeping his job. Political correctness has gone too far, he later admitted to me. Yes, yes, my friends, it had already gone too far in 2002. Now in 2020, it has gone way too far beyond too far. Untreated and unchecked, the cancer of political correctness has metastasized through the entire body politic, infecting every institution in Western civilization. By now practically inoperable, it threatens to kill Western civilization itself by prohibiting its formerly unalienable freedoms of thought and expression. In retrospect, Therapy for the Sane was a canary in the coal mine of free speech. Like Plato, not Prozac, it too became an international bestseller in far-flung countries that had not yet succumbed to the fatuous tyranny of political correctness. Its attempted censorship in the U.S. by Bloomsbury's chief political commissar mimicked the daily censorship of dissenting i.e. politically incorrect views on university campuses and by mainstream media alike. It anticipated by 15 years the cancellation of Milo Yiannopoulos' book contract by Simon & Schuster, the firing of professors for speaking politically incorrect truths, the disinvitations issued to conservative or libertarian speakers on radicalized campuses coast to coast, and the refusal of politically correct politicians to call Islamic terrorism Islamic terrorism, among other travesties. It anticipated the state of outright totalitarianism imposed and enforced by progressive fascists wherever they are permitted to poison the wells and wellsprings of liberty. Over the years, 
I've received a lot of fan mail from readers of Therapy for the Sane, thanking me for the book, which has helped them question and change their lives in many positive ways. Perhaps strange to say, during all this time, I have never received a single complaint from any inmate of an insane asylum claiming to be offended by the title. Perhaps some overly zealous editors-in-chief should put that fact in their politically correct pipes and smoke it. Enjoy the book. Lost in a romance Wilderness of pain And all the children This is the 